Um, I think it's time to start the second talk. Um, so next up, we've got Gregory Saunders, who's going to be presenting on buff and the tyranny of speed. And he's been um, programming in Python since 1995. He has a PhD in computer science and has been working in the financial services industry for over 10 years. He is currently a Python developer at Optiva. Um, can we please give a warm welcome to Gregory? Thank you. Uh, good to see so many people. Um, obviously, uh, the uh, drawer of a uh, impressive sounding speak title, uh, Pyro, Tyranny, Speed. If you're going to do a uh, PyCon presentation next year, remember that. A little bit about me, uh, as already mentioned, uh, I started working in Python in 1995, in case you couldn't guess that I'm really old. Uh, that was version 1.2 back then. Wow. <laughs> I've worked in uh, financial services since 2003, and I'm currently at Optiva. Plug, plug. There's some, uh, some Optiva people in the back row there. Uh, hopefully they won't heckle me too much. Uh, but uh, yes, Optiva, best places to work, you know, check it out. All right, so quick outline of my talk. Uh, what's the problem we're trying to solve? That's uh, always a good thing to understand. Uh, what's protobuf and why would I use that? What's pyrobuf and why would I use that? Then we'll talk about the tyranny of speed and uh, finally uh, some strategies for improving performance, some of which are uh, a little more legitimate than others. I'll let you decide which is which. So what's the problem? So programs use data structures to represent information in memory. But those data structures usually aren't conducive to uh, storing that information or transmitting it over, for example, a network. Uh, so we have a need for something called serialization. It's also called marshalling uh, to, uh, to convert our data from the in-memory uh, format the, into a form that's more suitable for storing on disk or transmitting over a network, et cetera, et cetera. So ideally, any serialization strategy we use is going to be compact and fast, obviously. It's going to support validation. We want to make sure that the data is actually correct uh, and complete, and of course. And it will be backwards and forwards compatible. What that means is that if I've got uh, a message uh, produced with an older version of my software, I can still read it with a newer version. And if I've got a version produced with a newer version of the software, uh, the older version can at least still use the bits uh, that were present in the older version of the uh, message. Okay, so how can we solve this problem? Well, anyone who is at the IoT uh, Miniconf on Friday will know the answer. Use a Kalman filter. <laughs> if you don't understand, uh, check out Lachlan Backhall's excellent working with real-time data streams in Python presentation from Friday's IoT Miniconf. Now, if you can't use a Kalman filter to solve this problem, what else can we do? Well, to <laughs> <laughs> yes, just keep adding Kalman filters until this problem is solved. Um, OK, so uh, you might think we've solved this problem already. I mean, we've got XML, we've got JSON, we've got Pickle. You know, why can't we just use one of those? So XML and JSON have uh, some interesting advantages. They're human readable and editable. You can fire it up in VI and, uh, and mess around with it. Uh, it. They support validation, so XML DTDs or, or JSON schema you can use to validate your data. But they're not terribly compact, it's being text forms. Uh, they're significantly slower than binary formats. And the XML APIs, at least in my experience, tend to be complicated and unwieldy. What about Pickle? Pickle is, uh, is a binary format, not text. Uh, at least for protocol versions greater than zero, uh, but it's Python specific and you need to roll your own validation. So, what can we do? Enter protobuf. What is protobuf? So protobuf is short for protocol buffers. They're a flexible, efficient, automated mechanism for serializing structured data written by Google. So uh, basically the way that it works is you first define the structure of your data in a, a dot proto file, I'll give you an example in a second. You compile the dot proto file to generate a language specific uh, data access class or classes. Google's compiler supports 
all those languages, and there's third-party support uh, for other languages as well. You can uh, find out that by using Google. <laughs> anyway, um, so what does a proto file look like? Here's, uh, here's an example from the uh, protobuf documentation. Uh, we have a person message. Uh, you can see that the attributes of the, the person, some of them are required, some of them are optional. Uh, you can have enumerated types. Uh, you can have sub-messages. Uh, and you can have repeated uh, so, uh, uh, elements, which are obviously more than one. Uh, this, a person can have more than one phone number. You'll notice also that each uh, element has a, a tag number. Uh, those tag numbers identify that element in the serialized form. Uh, and they're useful because they help with the, uh, the backwards and forwards compatibility, as we'll, uh, as we'll see in a moment. You can also have default values for, uh, for your elements, so uh, pretty cool. So if you're using Python, when you compile your addressbook.proto file, what you get is an addressbook underscore pb2.py file, uh, which you can then import. And then you can use code, uh, like you see on the screen, to create a person object, uh, set the various fields uh, to their values, and then, once you've done that, uh, the person object will have, uh, it's a message, it will have uh, me methods like this. So is initialized will tell you if it is in fact correctly initialized, so if all the required fields are set. Um, serialize the string is going to return a binary string, a serialized form, uh, hopefully compact and suitable for storage on disk or transmitting over a network. And parse from string does the inverse. Okay? All right. So how does backwards and forwards compatibility work? Basically, you can take an existing message in a, in a dot proto file and you can update it. And as long as you follow certain rules, then that uh, message will still be compatible with older versions of your software and with newer versions of your software. And uh, the basic rules are, don't change the numeric tags. Once a field has a tag, don't change it. Uh, you can add optional and repeated fields, but you can't add new required fields. Obviously, that would break uh, backward compatibility. You can remove non-required fields. Uh, and uh, if a message that you have has a value for a non-required field, the newer version of the software will just ignore it. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, don't uh, reuse tag numbers, uh, because otherwise the newer version of your software will get confused by an older uh, version of your message. OK, so sounds pretty cool, right? What could possibly go wrong? Well, the problem is that uh, it's a little bit slow. So what's Pyrobuff, uh, apart from uh, being a Pyromaniac's uh, dream? Pyrobuff is an alternative to Google's Python Protobuf library, Lightning fast Scython code, two to four times faster. Hmm. Hang on, we better check that. Two to four times faster than Google's using their C backend, and 20 to 40 times faster than Google's pure Python implementation. Sounds impressive. So, uh, Pyrobuff was actually uh, originally written by uh, the nice people at AppNexus. Uh, it's open source, it's on GitHub. Uh, feel free to uh, go there and check it out. We especially appreciate uh, pull requests, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Uh, it works with Python 2.7 and Python 3.5, and it implements most of the Protobuf message API. So uh, in case you're not familiar with Protobuf, actually Protobuf has some other stuff in it, like RPC, uh, which Pyrobuf uh, does not implement. But uh, for the stuff we're talking about today, uh, it implements most of that Protobuf message API. Installation is easy, pip install. It does require that you have Scython, and uh, that means you need a, a C compiler. Uh, and that, that can be a little bit of a hassle, uh, especially on uh, Windows. Um, but uh, if you've got that, then uh, yeah, just pip install and away you go. Uh, it comes with its own uh, special compiler of proto files, uh, uh, originally called Pyrobuff, or um, yeah, so you just pyrobuff your dot proto file, and it generates a uh, module uh, called filename underscore dot proto underscore proto dot so or dot pyd or dot dll, depending on your platform, and you can just import that into Python and start using it. And it's faster. We'll see how much faster in a minute. Okay, so let's switch tack now. I want to talk about the tyranny of speed. What do I mean by that? So Pyrobus' big shtick is that it is fast. 
It's its uh, reason for existing. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't, in fact, implement the full protobuf message API. As I said a minute ago, it doesn't do RPC. It doesn't have some of the other features of protobuf. Uh, so its reason for being is that it's fast. And so if you uh, do what I did and try to make some bug fixes or add some features and uh, your changes negatively impact performance, uh, people don't like that. Uh, they, get, they get upset at you. Uh, did anyone see uh, Disney's uh, Aladdin movie? Probably uh, many of you have seen that movie. Yeah, there's a great quote from that movie. Uh, Iago, the, uh, the bird, says, With all due respect, your rottenness, couldn't we just wait for a real storm? Jafar, the evil wizard, says, Save your breath, Iago, faster! And Iago says, Yes, so oh mighty evil one. That's how it feels sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just as an aside, <clears throat> imposter syndrome. Uh, that's the feeling you get when you're a developer in an interpreted language in a company which prides itself on its extremely high performance, low latency C++ code. <laughs> and if you want to know more about that, see Bianca Gibson's enlightening imposter syndrome presentation from yesterday. Moving on. Okay, so general advice on optimizing your code. How can we make our code faster? Well, hopefully you've all seen this before. Choose your algorithms and your data structures carefully. That's the most important thing to make your code uh, work well. Uh, once you've done that, uh, you go through this loop, write some code, test it, make sure it works, profile it, find the bits that are uh, really uh, important, optimize those and go back to two. Don't go back to three, go back to two. <laughs> okay, now. In most cases, that's enough, but sometimes it's not. So enter Cython. Anyone use Cython? Cython? Hey, uh, awesome. Very nice. So what's Cython, for those of you who don't know? Uh, basically, it uh, helps you improve the, uh, the uh, speed of your code by basically uh, taking the advice of the song, code in C. Right? Syntax is uh, quite similar to Python, but it gets translated into C and compiled uh, into object code. And uh, you, can, you can make a very small number of changes to your code, sometimes none at all, and just compile it with Cython, and that can give you a performance boost just by itself. But if you, uh, if you move ahead and uh, actually uh, give your variables uh, types, then uh, uh, basically you can bypass all the type checking that Python does uh, by default, uh, because it can just assume that the value has a, a certain type. Right? So, uh, so that can improve the performance again uh, just by adding type information to your uh, method declarations and your variable declarations. Now, so what you would do, of course, is you would um, basically take the, uh, the common code, the performance critical code of your, uh, your application, you would put that into uh, Cython, perhaps rewrite a bit of it to make it even faster, and, uh, and distribute that. Well, Py uh, Pyrobuff actually goes one step further than that it actually generates a customized Cython module for each individual .proto file. So it's not just factoring out the common code and putting that in Cython, it's basically factoring out everything and putting that into Cython. Uh, and so that's how it gets uh, its impressive speed. Still, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're making uh, bug fixes or uh, uh, feature enhancements, uh, you might need to uh, especially if you, you know, uh, are needing to keep the performance up to uh, avoid the ire of your users, you might need some strategies for improving performance. So that's what I'd like to talk about next. As I said before, some of these are going to be a little more legitimate than others. Uh, so uh, I'll let you decide uh, what, uh, which ones are which. Uh, so first things first, though, you do need to measure. Uh, you, uh, you can't know whether you're actually improving performance uh, unless you measure it. Uh, so Pyrobuff uses PyTest for its testing, and PyTest, uh, this is PyTest-Benchmark modules. Anyone used it? PyTest Benchmark? Oh, oh good, one or two. Um, that basically allows you to benchmark your code in the tests and uh, work out how fast it is, and, uh, and then you can obviously tell whether your code is getting faster or slower. Um, so how do you use PyTest Benchmark? Uh, here's a, a, a unit test. Uh, we just decorate it with this PyTest.Mark.Benchmark thing. Uh, I don't know if that was implemented using wrapped. I suspect not. So uh, hopefully we can uh, fix that later. But anyway, um, so you just wrap it in that uh, benchmark decorator. Uh, I've set the warm up equal to true. So what it means is it's going to run it a few times to make sure uh, 
uh, there's no uh, issues with the initialization or whatever um, before it actually measures the performance. Uh, and then you basically you give it something to benchmark. So um, in this case, we're creating a message, we're getting the serialized form of that message, uh, and then we're, what we're benchmarking is the path from string method. Okay? Uh, we're just measuring how fast that is. And what PyTest Benchmark does is basically it runs it a bunch of times. It's got a time limit, uh, which from memory by default is one second. Um, but you can change that, obviously. And uh, it runs it a bunch of times, and it tells you uh, how fast it was. It gives you output that uh, it's actually text output, but, so it doesn't look quite this nice. But this is basically what it looks like. Um, and you can see uh, here what it's saying is that uh, the method uh, in microseconds, took a minimum of 3.16 microseconds, 0.17, sorry, uh, micros, uh, maximum of 287, which is quite a lot. This was done on, on Windows, so that could explain that. Um, a mean of 3.69, standard deviation of 1.28, median 3.62, and an interquartile range of 0.15. And Google's protobuf is there. And uh, as you can see, Google's protobuf is a lot slower. Uh, that's uh, the software implementation, the pure Python implementation of Google's protobuf uh, there. Okay, so uh, we've got our uh, benchmarking. We can measure our performance. Uh, we've written our code in Cython. How can we make it go a little bit faster? So here's one thing that I did. It's called Cython Fast Instantiation, buried in the documentation for Cython. Basically, uh, when uh, Pyrobuff instantiated new messages or sub messages. It used the traditional class constructor uh, that looks like that, class bracket bracket. Um, and if you know that you don't need what's in the init method, right, uh, you can actually bypass that, right? Uh, and so you can use class dot underscore underscore new underscore underscore, uh, and that will create the object without calling init. Uh, now, of course, if init does anything useful, you're going to have to do that yourself. But if you know init doesn't do anything useful, as I did, uh, then you, you can just bypass that entirely. And this actually improved the pass performance by about 8%. So that's one strategy that you can use to uh, uh, improve your performance. Here's what the code looks like. Uh, so initially, uh, the top, it looked like well, what we have at the top. So the list field was implemented uh, by constructing the N64 list class. The substruct field was the test SS1 class. And you uh, change that to underscore underscore new and uh, call the reset method, which gets called anyway. So uh, uh, there's no um, performance benefit from not calling it. And uh, that improved the performance uh, right there. So that's one uh, idea for improving performance. Another one that worked reasonably well Avoid unnecessary slicing. So, uh, Pyrobuff, uh, when it deserializes a sub message, uh, it actually takes the, uh, the string of data, uh, gets a substring of it, and passes that recursively into the deserialized method uh, to um, deserialize the sub message. Uh, now, of course, uh, you don't need to do that, right? You don't need to create a, uh, a, a slice of the string. You can just pass in the string with an offset. Uh, and just by doing that, we saved about 9% of the time. Uh, so that's something else you can try. Bypass unnecessary guard code. So um, here, this is the append method. So if you've got a repeated field, you can append a new value to the repeated field. And the append method looked like that. Firstly, it checks to make sure that uh, the value you're trying to append is of the appropriate type. Uh, and if it's not, it raises an exception. And then uh, it uh, calls the superclass as append method to append the value. Now, the list is a, is a subclass of Python's list class, right? So when I'm deserializing a, uh, a string, I've got a value, I know it's the correct type already. I don't need to check that. So what I can do is I can just say, all right, uh, call the list.append method with my list and the value x, and that bypasses the, um, uh, the type checking. But it only improved performance by about 1 or 2%, which I thought was um, uh, interesting, uh, given uh, the slowness of, uh, of uh, Python's exceptions. But anyway. So that was uh, a few uh, few methods there. Any other options? 
So, uh, hmm. <laughs> so the results that I've been showing you so far were uh, produced with Python zero, uh, with Pyrobos, sorry, 0 0.5.4. Uh, we're currently up to 0 0.5.9, and unfortunately, 0 0.5.4 had some, some subtle bugs. Uh, for example, if you initialized a sub-message, um, uh, basically, Pyrobuff could miss the fact that you'd initialized that sub-message in certain cases, and so uh, it wouldn't serialize the full message. Uh, so uh, the latest pass from string is about 38% slower than the values that I've been showing you. So, um, <laughs> so uh, of course, uh, if, you, uh, if you're wanting speed above everything else, then you don't fix these kinds of bugs, right? Again, I'll let you decide which of these are legitimate and which aren't. So I initially gave this talk at, uh, at SciPy a few months ago, and a few people uh, uh, suggested that I really needed to check out Captain Proto. Anyone heard of Captain Proto? Captain Proto. Infinitely faster. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Funny story, actually. Uh, uh, did anyone play the original Warcraft games back in the 1990s? Yeah, yeah. So what you had to do uh, when you were setting up the game is you had to tell it where your SoundCloud card was. You give, give it the IRQ, whatever. And when you'd done that, you would click a button to test it. And this booming voice would say, your sound card works perfectly. Well, my brother and I were doing this one day, and we were having some problems with the volume. And uh, so we'd tweak it around a bit, click the button, your sound card works perfectly. Uh, evidently, we clicked the button one too many times because at some point the, vo the booming voice changed what it was saying and in a very irritated tone it said, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> <laughs> so if Captain Proto is infinitely faster, it surely doesn't get any better than that. Uh, here's a screenshot from the, uh, the Captain Proto uh, website, infinitely faster. Okay, so how does Captain Proto achieve this miracle? <laughs> okay, so what it basically does is it shifts some of the burden to the parts of the code you're not measuring, right? <laughs> right? So if you can get uh, you know, some of the code out of the bit that's being measured, then uh, you can make the bit that is being measured a lot faster, and you can make claims like it's infinitely faster. Okay, so that's the way you do it. So, um, basically, Captain Proto, uh, when I tested it, Captain Proto was about six times faster to serialize the message than Pyrobuff, about three times faster to deserialize it, but the end-to-end -end time, and what I mean by end-to-end -end time is create a new message object and, and fill it with values, serialize it, deserialize it, and then get those values out of the object, right, the end-to-end -end time was four times slower than Pyrobuff. Uh, so, Depending on your use case, Captain Proto may or may not be faster for you. Um, you'll obviously, you'll have to test it. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm almost out of time here, but uh, so one more thing about the tyranny of speed, right, is that speed, when it comes down to it, is a race. And one genuinely bad idea is, uh, is to be a, a lone developer, uh, you know, tapping away at Python, uh, trying to release a faster version of a piece of software written by Google. <laughs> so two weeks ago, Google released Protobuf 3.0. Now, the pure Python implementation is about 13 times slower than, uh, than Pyrobuf, but the C++ implementation is only about 30% slower than Pyrobuf. So not the two to four times that the, uh, the Pyrobuff documentation claims. However, uh, both Captain Proto and C++ Protobuf, so that not the pure py Python Protobuf, but the C++ version, require you to um, basically download and install uh, a separate package, the C++ version of their, of their library, basically, uh, onto your system and then install the Python module. Right? So if you can't do that for, for whatever reason, uh, then you can't take up the advantages of Captain Proto or C++ Protobuf. Uh, to give an example, we use um, Protobuf uh, at, at Optiver, obviously, and uh, in our CI pipeline, uh, we can uh, fire up a Python virtual environment, we can pip install anything we like, but downloading and installing a C++ library is significantly more difficult. So the, um, the work to get the C++ implementation is, is harder, but uh, if you do get it, then um, the performance gain of, of using Pyrobuff isn't uh, as great as, as uh, the documentation claims. Okay, uh, well, that's it. 
Any questions? This. Hi, I'm curious about these protocols and what sort of considerations you have to take into account when dealing with untrusted or, actual, or act, actively malicious input. Right, yes, security is a big deal. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things I was going to say, I meant to say actually, I forgot, uh, when I talked about sacrificing correctness is the other thing you do is sacrifice security and uh, that, that will make your code faster as well. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, obviously, uh, uh, Google and uh, Captain Proto have taken uh, security uh, into account uh, very seriously in their versions of the library. Parabuff, because it's a sort of a skunkworks project, I guess, uh, probably not so much. So if, if security is a real concern for you, then I would have to honestly say probably use Protobuf or Captain Proto uh, at this point. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll address some of the security uh, stuff in, in Parabuf um, uh, in, in forthcoming updates. Yeah. Um, what other uh, types of uh, Python library or, or, or you know application domain would the techniques uh, specifically, first of all, using Python, and then secondly, some of these other things that you've talked about? Uh, what, what other things would that be applicable to? Oh, lots of things. Uh, basically, anywhere where you're um, uh, Cythonizing something, uh, you can do these kinds of optimizations. So fast instantiation, for example, um, applies anywhere. It's just that's just about creating an object. Um, so if you can create the object and you don't need to call it's in it, uh, then that, that applies anywhere, right? It's not a Parabuff specific thing. Um, so yeah, it applies anywhere. Um, if you want to know more about that, actually I'd try and have a look at some of the work that they did optimizing um, scikit-learn. Uh, I think someone did a, a talk in PyCon a couple of years ago about um, the optimizations of scikit-learn. Uh, they were using uh, a number of different approaches to optimizing performance, including, for example, um, uh, taking advantage of the cache. If you have large messages, I suppose the, the cache could become an issue, but the messages I'm dealing with are all too small to, for the cache to be an issue. So. Due to your time, this is my last question. Um, good talk. and. Interesting to know some of the techniques to get better performance out of uh, low-level Python stuff. Um, when you benchmark like message serialization sort of libraries, mm. um, often it varies quite a bit with different data types and sizes mm. of messages. Yes. Um, what sort of data types and message sizes were you benchmarks on? Yeah, so uh, I used uh, an example message uh, that was uh, part of the Parabuff test suite. Uh, so it had a variety of field types in it. Um, uh, including repeated, optional, string, int, float, uh, all kinds of things. But it was, yeah, it was just one message uh, that I was testing uh, with obviously a fixed number of fields. I didn't test smaller or larger messages, that sort of thing. So obviously, uh, you would want to test that with your own messages. Um, but uh, hopefully, it gives you an idea at least of what the, the performance is like. Mm. Okay, just final, final. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a quick one. Uh, what's been your experience with Parabuff going to Python 3.5? Uh, yeah, so um, actually when I initially did this talk, uh, it didn't work with Python 3.5 and I, and I had to fix the problems. Um, so the main problem was uh, with Unicode strings. Uh, so uh, by default uh, in Python 2.7, uh, you, you could just give it strings and that would be fine. But in Python 3.5, if you throw it a string, that's a Unicode object and, and suddenly uh, it becomes an issue. Uh, so basically what you had to do was make sure uh, at every point that, uh, that you actually had a byte string and not a Unicode string. Uh, so uh, it now works and it will uh, throw exceptions if you don't give it the right kind of string. Uh, so that was the biggest issue I, I had. What with. performance? Uh, I don't have any numbers on that. That's a good question. Um, uh, if you want uh, numbers, I can get them and I'll send them to you. So give me your contact details. Okay. Can we please give another round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.